one second while I sync these cameras. Greetings, unsettled souls! Oh, welcome to the Correct Views. Sam I beat again. She's doing political commentary for the media speaks. Adjusting the lights on both cameras by myself can be a little hard. Let me make sure it's not right in the face. There we go. I'm a little bit red because I went to a Pirates game for, um, for Memorial Day. It was fun. It's, an, it's a release. You need to get away from all of this left and right stuff, or you will lose your mind after a while. Um, thanks for tuning in, friends. Remember that this is listener-supported. That means that the information you get here I've compiled for free. Okay, I get paid absolutely nothing for it, unless you see fit to, to fund the show. And if you do, I would genuinely appreciate it. You can do so at the correct views at hotmail.com. Give through PayPal. Every penny you give to me goes towards a better show. And uh, we're going to get into that show right now, friends. What we got today is a huge health update. I did a, um, I did a report, I want to say a couple of years ago, about it's called How to Almost Never Get Sick. <clears throat> I talk about um, the vitamins that I take to prevent the fact that I just about never get sick, thankfully. When I do, when I do I'm over it very, very quickly. Um, it's free. I'm not sponsored by anybody. I don't make any money for doing it. So look up how to almost never get sick. This is not a continuation of that, but it is, it is a story that has to do with a lot of information that they would rather you didn't have. And uh, we're going to go straight to it here. <clears throat> CBS News. More Americans suffering from stress, anxiety, and depression, new study finds. Now, see, I'm not surprised by this. Because one of the things that I have to take in order to go to sleep is melatonin. And the reason for that is I'm a naturally high-strung person. People will watch this and they'll see me swaying back and forth or sometimes rocking rather vigorously in my chair. And they will wonder if I've had a nose full of something, or and I have not. Um, it's naturally high strung. I think a lot of it is just you work so hard in your life to get to where you want to get to that by the time you have arrived there, you're too stressed to ever be able to truly enjoy it. And a lot of the things that I've wanted my whole life have come together at the same time. But I, at some points you wonder if it was even worth it for the amount of uh, stress, for instance, that I had growing up. My dad was like a school tyrant. Um, I loved the man greatly, missed the man greatly. He was very, very stressful. So you, you grow into being a very stressful person. And then, um, I don't know, there's, there's, been, there's been times in my life where I know that I have done everything correctly. And things have gone just as badly for me as when I know that I have done everything wrong. And uh, that's, uh, that's oftentimes very frustrating. I don't know. I don't, what kinds of things really, really set you off? Feel free to you know, put it in the comment lines. I'm going to get into this article here. More Americans than ever before are stressed, depressed, and anxiety-ridden. And many are unable to get the help that they need, a new study suggests. An estimated 8.3 million adults, that's 3.4% of, of the U.S. population, suffer from serious psychological distress, an evaluation of federal health data concluded. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not shocked that it is 3.4%, except for the fact that I would have reasoned it to be far, far higher. I would have guessed 25 to 30%. I'm shocked that it's that low. I would be interested to find out if other people have seen that it has been that low because that seems a bit impossible to me. But okay, that's what that's as low as they say it. If it is, then we're an incredibly blessed country. Uh, mental illness is on the rise, suicide is on the rise, and access to care for the mentally ill is getting worse, said lead researcher Judith Weissman. She's a research manager at the Department of Medicine at NYU Lagoon Medical Center in New York City. It says this increase is likely affecting the after effect of the Great Recession. Now see, they always go back to, you know, it's from the Great Recession, it's from this, it's from... Let me tell you what one of the things it's from. I'll be real here for a minute. It's from, among other things, a very poor, m mismanaged school system. 
we live in a society where the school system does one or two things. They either just allow the students that aren't already achieving on their own, and by that I mean within the realm of the four corners curriculum, I call it, that they give you. Or you can sink. Or they do what the schools where I went did, and they, they beat you and uh, basically abused you. Um, now, I know they don't do that in schools anymore. They, they tend to be more the other direction now. But I think that does it. I think that since we live in a society where it's cool now, it's, it's an accepted norm to be able to get yours, yo, get yours at whatever cost. That, that is permeating the society. And it's creating a lot of problems within us to where it's... How do I want to word this? It's creating problems within us where we are willing to do anything to one another to get that which we want that which, not even that we need, that we kind of want, or that we think somebody else has told us that we should want. I think that's a lot of it. I, th I think you could solve a lot of problems by really listening to what I just said there and not programming people the way we do, because we program people to be incredibly anxious, to be incredibly anxiety-ridden, and then we condemn them for it, even when they start to succeed in the way that they taught. Because we were taught wrong, that's why. It said investigators found that between 26, 2006 and 2014, access to health care services had deteriorated. Well, a lot of that goes back to what I said earlier. Okay, this isn't to do with the economic turmoil that they're so obsessed with here. But I'll tell you one of the things that are behind this study that I want to warn you from, and that would be the, uh, the acceptance of psychotropic drugs. I'm probably going to offend a couple of people here, but so be it. If you are constantly taking Xanax, or Ativan, or Lithium, or whatever your drug of choice is, you are doing two things. One of them you know. You know right away that the drug isn't really helping you. It's just drugging you enough that you don't care that you really don't care. Second of all, you're destroying your liver. Whatever peace of mind you're getting from taking it, you're destroying your liver. Now, have I ever taken it? Of course I have. I, 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 I took them for leisure before, when I was younger. And then I had a really good friend hang herself. And uh, I went through a painful breakup at the time. And I took four or five days worth of um, anxiety medication. Not all at one time. I mean, I took them, and then I... The grieving process, I told myself, was a certain amount of time. And then you take yourself off of them. But that's not what people are doing. People are taking them, and they are staying on them because they're liking the way that it feels. And that, my friends, is a slippery slope. And if you take nothing away from the first segment of this show, please take that away. Uh, do not get on those. You'll greatly regret that. I promise you, you'll regret it. It will be one of the worst mistakes you've ever made in your life. I've seen it happen to a lot of people that were close to me. And my dad was a psychiatric nurse. So you're getting a lot of this from uh, somebody that knows what they're talking about and somebody who had spoken to people, uh, obviously, uh, within the healthcare field outside of my own father. And uh, not that I've ever needed care, thankfully, but my point being... There are a lot of healthcare professionals that worked in the mental health industry that I know. My ex has experience working in it. And all of them agree that in the long term, even, even doctors hint, you know, they, they whisper in break rooms, so to speak, that these are dangerous, dangerous drugs. Uh, moving on, friends, NBC News. A new poll finds the majority of Americans have smoked marijuana. Now, this did not surprise me. Um... If you're watching this right now and you partake, you know what, I, I think you're probably harming absolutely nobody whatsoever. Have I ever partaken? Yes, I have. I, I don't see a problem with it. If you're worrying about lung cancer, they say that there's no connection. Most studies show that there is no connection between marijuana smoke and lung cancer. Did you know that? However, if you're really worried about it, you can get vaporizers and things like that that make it absolutely... I don't mean like vape pens, but vaporizers. It makes it, uh, at that point, absolutely harmless. And uh, it doesn't have any lasting mental, none of the mental problems, none of the crap you were told when you were in uh, grade school. 
The new studies have found that it's actually quite helpful for a lot of people. Some people don't like it. It's like any other drug. Okay? It helps some people or it doesn't others. It helps some relax. Others, it makes them very nervous. It's not that we're giving marijuana to everyone. We're saying that if you want to smoke it and you're not harming anybody else, then that's your constitutional God-given right to do so. Uh, Mary Emily O'Hara, planning on celebrating 420 this Thursday. It's a big day to do. You aren't alone. According to the new poll released Monday, 52% of Americans over the age of 18 have tried marijuana at some point in their lives. The survey conducted by Yahoo News and Marist Poll found that only, not only have most adults in the U.S. smoked it, but 44% of those who tried it still use it today. That means 44% of the people that have ever smoked it kept smoking, and it helped a little less than half of the people, or gave them something in their life that made them a, maybe a social smoker, such as uh, somebody will try a drink of alcohol and become a social drinker. I really don't think there's any problem with that. Despite marijuana still being federally classified as a dangerous Schedule One drug on par with heroin, American attitudes toward the drug have changed over time. Now let, me, let me tell you something here. When you say something that stupid, it absolutely undermines the entire rest of anything you were going to say. What I mean is, if you say that Donald Trump is just like Adolf Hitler because you don't like him, you now sound so stupid. I mean, I'm sorry, you simply sound so stupid that nobody's ever going to listen to you, nor are they going to take you seriously. However, if you say, I really don't like Donald Trump because I don't support him getting us out of NAFTA. I enjoy outsourcing. I don't know. I guess that's all you can say. Um, then somebody might listen to you. They might think you're an idiot, but they're going to listen to you. They're not going to think you're stupid. You're just wrong. If you say that marijuana is on par with heroin, and you begin to teach children that, then they're going to smoke marijuana, and they're going to see their friends smoke marijuana, and guess what's going to happen? They're going to try it, they're going to live, and then they're going to try heroin. Okay, these do not need to be classified in the same category. That's more, way more harm than is good um, for this. I will say this, for those of you that say, oh, drugs are always good, nothing like that. You know, if you have a history of schizophrenia, for instance, uh, you should never use LSD because it'll, it'll create a problem in you that you may never be able to fix. Um... The Yahoo Mars poll found that out of the respondents who have tried pot at some point, 65% are parents. In fact, people who are current marijuana smokers are slightly more likely to be parents. Well, that's probably because of the stress of their kids. That makes perfect sense. 62% uh, of respondents says they wouldn't use marijuana as a self-prescribed pain reliever, even if it were legal. Well, that is fine. I mean, that, that is their right to live in pain if they want to. I mean, we're not, I don't think anybody who's on the, uh, whether they're a smoker or not, I don't think anybody is in favor of mandating that anybody smokes marijuana here. And I know that sounds stupid, but you tend to hear that over and over and over again. Well, I would never do it. I don't remember anybody asking you to. Dumbass. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. We're going to keep moving on here to the strangest of the stories for the day. Umbilical cord blood from babies. I know, you're going, what the hell? Could help bring back memory for dementia patients. Now, yeah, this is going to go into to some, some touchy ground here, but that's fine. We're not a politically correct show, so we let it fly. I didn't have a big problem with stem cell research. They needed embryonic stem cell research for a moment. That moment's come and gone, by the way. They don't really need to do that as much these days. They had found out that adult stem cells actually work much better than embryonic stem cells. It was really a short debate for a short period of time, and science has sort of progressed past it in many ways. I didn't have a problem with it. I'm a firm believer in taking care of the people that are already here. That doesn't mean I'm for coat hangering yourself in the third trimester, because I'm not. But I don't have a problem with it. And this is even more humane, because uh, the baby's not using it currently. Uh, listen, it, it's weird, but if you've ever known someone, all jokes aside, 
who have had Alzheimer's or something like it, then you can completely understand where I'm going with this and why it's a, it's a uh, topic of pure dread. Dementia patients have been offered hope that their memory could be repaired after scientists showed that injecting blood from the umbilical cords of human babies restores brain function. Researchers at the Stanford University School of Medicine in the U.S. discovered that cord blood contains an important protein which vanishes as humans get older. It is believed that the protein encourages neuroplasticity in the brain, allowing neurons to adapt and communicate more effectively. When human cord blood was injected into elderly mice, they performed far better, it says, in learning and memory tests, and even started nesting again, gathering up cotton wands to make beds, an instinctive behavior that is largely forgotten in old age. So, friends, you understand where this is going, right? One of the... You take a great mind, like that of Ronald Reagan, and you inject it with a little bit of Alzheimer's to use... A, you get Alzheimer's. People say, you don't inject Alzheimer's. It was an analogy. Put some Alzheimer's into them, and their brain is useless. Do you know that um, Malcolm Young, the guitar player, a uh, rhythm guitarist for ACDC, Angus's uh, brother, the one that struts, he can't remember certain ACDC songs, and that was a couple of years ago. At this point, he may not even remember being an ACDC. My landlord that owns, his wife now owns this studio, died of Alzheimer's. It's just a huge breakthrough, friends. I'll tell you something else that you may not have known that's really cool. If, um, if, you, in, if you bring in a certain amount of coconut oil into your diet, you can do a lot to not only prevent Alzheimer's from coming, but if it is already here in someone that you love or you're showing signs of it yourself, Coconut oil will greatly slow the progress of the, the uh, disease, at least in terms of its mental symptoms. And that is wonderful news, since people can suffer with it for a very long time. Alzheimer's Society Head of Research Dr. James Pickard said everyone experiences some decline in memory as they get older. The possibility that this process can be reversed by an infusion of young blood sounds like the stuff from science fiction, but this is what the study is beginning to show. Good! The study finds that a factor in the human umbilical cord blood can enter into the brain and restore the same processes that are essential for forming new memories. The researchers think that the cord repairs in the, hip the hippocampus, a part of the brain which in mice and humans is critical for converting experiences into long-term memories. It says, for largely unknown reasons, the hippocampus is especially vulnerable to normal aging. With advancing age, the hippocampus degenerates, loses nerve cells, and shrinks. Hippocampal deterioration is an early manifestation of Alzheimer's disease. And all results, all, all results argue that systemic factors present early in life may be beneficial to the revitalization of aged tissue. And that the protein represents much of the restorative factor for the aged hippocampus. That is wonderful news. It says, after realizing that something in the umbilical cord blood was making our brains act younger, old brains act younger, the scientists set out trying to work out what it was and discovered the protein was called TIMP2. Injecting TIP2 into its, by itself into elderly mice largely duplicated the beneficial effects of umbilical cord blood. In our study, it mimicked the memory and learning effects we were getting from cord plasma, and it appeared to do so by improving hypocampal function. It says, although treatments tested here boosted some aspects of learning and memory in mice, we don't know how relevant these findings yet might be in people. And this is, again, where I'm on uh, the side of Donald Trump here. If, if someone is suffering <coughs> pardon me, from Alzheimer's, and I mean, really, at that point, what do you have to lose by going ahead and trying something different? What do you have to lose by trying something that maybe won't work or could kill you, considering that Alzheimer's is a death sentence anyway? 
Friends, uh, you're listening to The Correct Views brought to you by the Seacrest Motel. If you've not been to the Seacrest Motel and you've been to Sandusky, make sure that you go. Because if you don't, you're getting ripped off. Uh, really good room prices. You want a better room price? Do you want to get a better room price even than what the Seacrest Motel in Sandusky, Ohio normally gives you? Fine, I'll tell you how to do it. Tell them that you are a listener to The Correct Views and uh, you're going to get a discount just because uh, you mentioned the show when you check in. How's that? The Telegraph Science, is this the end of blood donation? Scientists close to unlimited blood supply from stem cells. This is remarkable news again. Blood donors may no longer be needed in the future after scientists showed it was possible to create blood from stem cells. Now, this is good news for anybody that donates, which is me. I haven't done so in a while. I'm not going to pretend that I'm this great moral saint that always gets up early in the morning and lets them jab him, but I have. A lot. Um, both arms, you can tell. Blah, 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 blah. Now, when I went to Stark State, they, uh, they had phlebotomists. And for those of you that don't know, they go from injecting oranges and apples to taking blood from you. And they have to take blood from so many people before they can become a phlebotomist. And guess who their favorite pincushion was? I'm not even afraid of vampires today after the amount of times that they have attacked me and taken blood from me when I was at Stark State. What if someday you didn't have to donate blood anymore? Now, everybody in high school and college knows you donate blood on blood donor day because you get out of class, you get a free pass, you're treated like a king. But all jokes aside, what if we didn't have to do that to save lives anymore? The 20-year project could pave the way for an unlimited number of blood and immune cells for transplants simply by reprogramming a patient's own skin cells. Therefore, it's your own blood. The research reported in the na journal Nature holds out numerous promise for developing personalized treatment for blood disorders, drug screening, and reducing shortages of donated blood. Dr. Reichi Sugamura of Boston Children's Hospital said... This gives us the potential to have a limited supply of blood stem cells and blood by taking cells from universal donors, of which I am one. This could potentially augment the blood supply for patients who need transfusions. Universal means you have a blood type that you can give to anyone, a positive, I believe. This step opens up an opportunity to take cells from patients with genetic blood disorders, use gene editing to correct their genetic defect and make functional blood cells for patients receiving treatments for cancer, blood disorders after accidents or during surgery, or new moms who lose blood in childbirth. Blood is an absolutely essential part of health care. So it says in England, the number of people becoming donors and giving blood for the first time dropped to 24.4%. So uh, the new research from Boston had teamed up with embryonic stem cells and exposed them to chemical soup that triggered their transformation into a tissue which, are, which eventually makes blood stem cells. This work is a culmination of 20 years of striving, said Dr. George Daly, who heads up the research in the lab of Boston Children's Hospital Stem Cell Program. He's the dean of Harvard Medical School. So I think we can trust what he's saying here. Good news. Excellent news. And only two stories to left, left in our show today, your uh, ma massive health care update show. Uh, this one's short, sweet, and to the point. World's oldest human being ever recorded dies 146 years old in Indonesia. That's not the oldest. Uh, the Bible is, in fact, a book of history. It is not a book of analogy. And therefore, we know that people have lived much longer. However, why did that stop? Because genetic defects have gotten into the human DNA. And now we don't live nearly as long as this 146-year-old person did. Uh, Sodemigio's official papers claim that he was born in December 1870, which makes him older than Jeanette Clement, who died in 1997 at 122 years old. Look at that, friends. The unofficial world's oldest human being has just passed away at the age of 146, reports Blasting News. The Indonesian Christian man named uh, Sparman, like Superman, Saparman Sodemijo, also known to the village as Mabo Goto or Grandpa Goto, passed away in his home in central Java. Unverified claims a local publication that was able to investigate the man's papers claimed in 2010 
that so damage your would it turn 142 years old on his next birthday. If the claim is true, then the man would be over that would be 19 years older than that, which is the oldest record of a recorded human meaning when we had birth certificates, not the Bible. The French centurion Jeanette Clement, of course, we just talked about, died at 122. Bef born before birth certificates existed, according to his papers, he was allegedly born in December of 1870. The biggest problem when it comes to verifying his claims is that Indonesia only started to record births in 1900. This means that the department responsible for the records would have had to take the boy and his parents' word regarding when he was actually born. However, based on his stories and his memories of the construction of a sugar factory in 1880, several officials were convinced of his age's authenticity. Um, get this, friends. Deteriorating health. The long, lifelong smoker. My wife smokes like a chimney. She won't make it to 35 if she doesn't quit. 146. A lifelong smoker was admitted to the hospital last month due to some undisclosed issues he was having. Six days later, the man asked to be checked out and taken home. Ever since his return, the man apparently lost his appetite and refused to eat, drink, or eat. His grandson, Soyanto, told the BBC that they were having problems feeding him and that his grandfather simply wanted them to let him go. Which is very strange. You'd want to see, you'd think he'd want to keep going once you'd made it that far. The secret to his long life was, according to everyone in the village, it says, treated an unbelievably old man as a local hero, and they asked him about his secret to longevity. In one interview, he simply stated that patience and being surrounded by people who love you is the key. The man likely has the later in spades as he had outlived four wives, all of his children, and his ten brothers and sisters. Despite outlasting the people he loved, the man still had a lot of affection from the people in the village due to his numerous stories, including clashes with the Japanese forces all the way back to Dutch invaders. He was buried on Monday and his family in a plot it had previously purchased due to the lack of concrete evidence of any living witnesses. There is currently still no way of verifying the man's age, which is why his title of the oldest human being ever recorded still remains unofficial. Um, they should have, I mean, maybe kind of grim, they could have picked it up in an autopsy and that's probably what they should have done. But you know, they're dumdies. But not as dumpty as the person who's getting the dumpty of the day. You guys know it. The dumpty of the day is what we do at the very end when we are winding, winding it down. The last show, the stupidest person that we've heard of of the day. And we have him. Or we should say we have her. Woman 26. Cited after the Charleston police said she scared carriage horses with a T-Rex costume, the Post and Courier. Now, friends, if I ever get arrested, you see that, again, I, I get arrested once. If I ever get arrested again, uh, twice, actually. If I ever get arrested, it's going to be right there. It's going to be like that. I'm going down scaring horses in a T-Rex costume because that's just way too crazy. And even though she's getting the dumb deer of the day, I have great love for her because it's hilarious. A 26-year-old West Ashley woman was ticketed Friday after Charleston police said she caused an accident by scaring two carriage horses with a Tyrannosaurus Rex costume. Well, maybe the horse needed to be a little more mellow himself. Maybe he should get the dumb deer of the day. Nicole Wells of Ashley River Road was cited for a misdemeanor charge of disorderly conduct and wearing a mask or disguise at a public event. A city code violation. Now, I, I, that's where you got to wonder if government overreach is there. I mean, I, I'm all for banning the burqa, but it's a slippery slope once we do so. Because uh, then you can ban people in Guy Fox masks and all kinds of things. So I'm not in favor of that. But uh, we'll go on with it here. Because it's interesting. I mean, how often do you hear about somebody getting arrested for scaring some a horse in a T-Rex mask? Oh, now my story vanished. Where is it? There we go. Wells was released after turning herself in Friday morning. Spokesman Charles Francis said she was not jailed. Why did she turn herself in? The incident was reported shortly after 5 p.m. on Thursday near Tommy Condon's restaurant on Church Street 2. 
palmetto carriage horse workhorses named Yogi and Boo Boo, who were too uh, dumb to know somebody was in a costume, even for a horse, were pulling 16 passengers when a woman dressed in an orange tie on a Saurus Rex costume got in front of the carriage and started making growling noises, according to the witnesses. She refused to move after being warned several times that she was upsetting the horses. The horses jumped and jackknifed the carriage. Yogi fell on the hunches, and the driver was thrown to the pavement. The will ran over his right leg. He was taken to the hospital for treatment. He was walking with crutches Friday with a bruised leg and a bruised foot. Ambulance chasing, indeed. Initially, it was reported, I'm kidding, that Yogi was scratched. But officials later confirmed he was not hurt. No, pa no passenger injuries were recorded. The dinosaur shuffled off to the parking garage on Cumberland Street and got into a car, according to surveillance video. At a press conference Friday afternoon, Palmetto Carriage Works President Tom Doyle said staffers had seen people lay down in the street to stop the horses, as well as insults at drivers and passengers. We've seen the attacks getting more and more brazen. Well, I don't know that this was an attack... But uh, the Animal Society decreed the dinosaur incident as animal cruelty and offered a $2,500 reward. That's why she turned herself in. Um, <sighs> All right, friends, what else are you going to say to that? The Animal Society has been trying to get carriage companies to agree on an independent study on how carriage horses tolerate uh, such behavior. Look, it's real easy, friends. Don't be an idiot around horses and you won't win the dumb the other day. Second of all, maybe we spend, need to spend a little bit more time teaching the horses and putting blinders and things like that on them before we go bringing them into public. It's just a thought. Friends, thank you for listening to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangie signing off, reminding you that you can donate to the show at thecorrectviewsofhotmail.com. Give through PayPal. Every penny you give to me goes towards a better show. And remember, they've been defunding us, so the only way we get paid is from you. So, thanks. Good night, friends. God bless.